Hey everyone, so this is Kate Utassi uh, of the podcast Hear Me Roar with Kate Utassi and uh, formerly of Hammer Time with Nikki and Kate. I want to welcome you all back to the podcast and remind everyone that this is the new revamped podcast that has a new website, hearmeroarpodcast.com and all new social media accounts uh, on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, YouTube, and soon to be um, new episodes soon to be put up on iTunes and Google Play. The old episodes of Hammer Time are still available on iTunes and Google Play under Hammer Time with Nikki and Kate. So I had the great honor of speaking with Angie of Angelina Rose Photography earlier today. I apologize in advance for what you're about to hear of the audio quality. Um, We were kind of in a glass bubble, and so I tried to do my best to um, uh, reduce the uh, amount of extraneous noises, but you're going to hear some, unfortunately. So uh, I will not allow that mistake to be made again by myself in the in the future, but please uh, just indulge me this one time. So Angie and I, uh, Angie's a current business owner and I am a former business owner, so you're going to hear our wonderful discussion that we had earlier today about being women in business, being um, younger business owners. And uh, although we are obviously both female and uh, are, are both on the younger side, when we started our, our businesses, um, I, I really believe that this episode is really relatable and has a lot of great information for anyone that's interested in running their own practice, their own business, even to anyone who's uh, just a business professional. And so I hope you'll enjoy. Um, we did we did run on a little bit long, uh, a little bit longer than my podcasts usually are, and I attribute that to us not seeing each other for a little while. Um, we can get to catching up a bit, and it can take a few hours. So with that being said, I will be trying to create almost mini episodes or highlights that um, address specific issues. But in the meantime, I am producing this mega episode that discusses about where we came from, uh, what kind of businesses we ran or, or are running, as the case may be, what made us decide to open our own business, um, whether we had any prior knowledge or experience prior to doing so. Uh, what it was like for us being females, what it was like for us to be in our mid-20s, um, whether we had any mentors, what are some are some of our kind of failures uh, that we experienced, some of our greatest successes, some tips that we had for others, how we feel like we were mentored and had to push past our fears and vulnerabilities in order to make sure that we were doing it um, in a properly and respectful way, our kind of business models and approaches to business, and a whole lot more. And Angie actually asked me a lot about the criminal justice system. So for anyone who's interested in that, in mental health issues involving the criminal justice system, inequalities in it, um, racial and socioeconomic disparities, sex offender issues, the whole lot. We, we really caught up, and so I hope that you'll enjoy this kind of mega episode. Um, I'll be back in a little while with my next episode, which will be a more appropriate and an ingestible length, and uh, as I said, I'll try and cut, cut these down to more sizable um, and ingestible durations, but until then, please enjoy. And I hope that you'll contact me at any of these social media accounts or the website or my email, hearmeroarpodcast at gmail.com. If you have any feedback, feedback, questions, 
or suggestions for future episodes. And as always, thank you so much for listening. I hope that this resonates with at least one or two of you. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to let me know. I can always pass along your questions to Angie. And I am, again, so honored that she joined me today. So without further ado, I hope you'll enjoy episode two of the Hear Me Roar podcast about women in business and small business ownership. Thanks. So um, as I mentioned, I used to run a law firm. I, For those of you who are unaware, I am now disabled, but I used to run a criminal defense practice in Rhode Island and Massachusetts called the Law Office of Catherine Godin. And uh, I had no, no business knowledge or experience prior to opening my practice in 2009. Um, it was, I was so grateful and I'm sure Angie, I, I think we talked about this in a prior conversation, uh, being grateful of others to kind of mentor yes. you through it because I had no, no idea how to run a business. I was, I was, I knew I had skills in trial advocacy and legal research and writing I, I felt confident in that, but I did not feel confident about, you know, establishing prices and clients. clients. Yeah. Oh, uh, there aren't even taxes. <laughs> I know, exactly. So The financial aspect, I think, is uh, usually the, the most difficult. Yes. And so for me, I don't know, I don't know why someone didn't warn me of this sooner, even my, not to... I won't mention their name, but not to throw my uh, business lawyer under the bus. But um, I opened my practice November 12th of 2009. And so I was really only in business for six weeks in that calendar year and still had to pay the $500 mandatory minimum uh, tax income uh, for a business Ouch. for the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was. A little thought on their part. About yeah, the best a little benefit. oversight, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, but I was excited to, to get going, and yeah. so I wanted to just start up. So what? Uh, why don't you tell the listeners a bit about what made you want to start your photography business? So I knew that I wanted to start my own business, and uh, my husband actually was really supportive. At the time, um, I don't think we were married, but we'd been dating for an extraordinarily long time. Yeah. Um, Shout out to Chris. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he was really helpful in having me. Also, he's an economics major. I was a biologist. Oh, that's and, great. Um, so he was super helpful in being able to look at the finances and look at the financials of owning certain types of businesses and really what it would be in terms of like how long a day, how much money would that make, you know, what's the potential revenue you could do. Right. Um, so he was my little business uh, plan. That's essentially. great. Um, yeah, and then I sort of actually, to be honest, like sort of stumbled into the photography, and it just merged so, so well um, my artistic creativity as well as my analytical thinking, where yeah. it's, you know, the creative mixed with uh, the, you know, uh, compositions, um, lighting, and so it sort of merged my left and right sides of my brain, and I was yeah. like, this is good, and it allows me the freedom that I was looking for and the flexibility if I want it. However, it can also like really uh, take over your life at the same time. Yes. So you find yes, that problem. balance. Yes. And uh, and I just finished uh, editing my book that I'm going to be submitting to literary agents. Ooh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to send out all the letters. So fast. I feel like it's I, I know. Yeah, it was. It was. It was about a year. But then I think about uh, Jean Dominique Boubier. Uh, of of the, the documentary the, the Diving Bell and the Butterfly um, and he had a stroke and he was a friend, the editor of French L magazine had a stroke at 44 could only use one eyelid and blinked a, oh my God. <laughs> blinked a book in That's 10 impressive. months 10 months he inspired me so much that's why I had a Diving Bell tattooed onto my arm um, but anyways yeah I've, I'm excited about the book uh, and hopefully that'll come out uh, maybe sometime next year. But in it, I talk about how I didn't have that balance. And I'm so proud of you for, you know, fighting to find that balance. Because for the five years that I was running my practice, I never, never took it. 
I never took the time to do it. And, and I think that's something that um, to anyone out there who's considering opening their own practice or maybe uh, just starting your own practice, please remember you, are, you can be the worst boss in the world to yourself. I think I, I might have been listening to RuPaul uh, and he was talking about how it can be hard to be your own boss because it's the hardest. Yeah. You really like with, with another. Yeah. I mean, with another, with any other job, right. Yeah. You report to the job, you work an eight, maybe 10, maybe 12 hour shift, but you go home, you yeah. shut it off and then it's done. Whereas you're doing it all every the second time, of the day. every second of every day. There's always more work to be done, but you never like, you can never really recognize the shutoff button because you're the one responsible for it. You essentially become your work. Yes. Yeah. And it, uh, my, my counselor at the end of my five years of running the practice, um, she had me buy a stop button, like one of those <laughs> actual yeah. machine run uh, red Clock. buttons. And I incidentally, um, Office Max, I thought the, the, the buttons that they had said stop. But it says some. It said something different. So I went to buy one at Office Max, and I realized that it didn't say stop on it. So I actually bought like one of those. I don't know that probably can stop like a, a an assembly line or a crane, <laughs> crane or something. But I bought, bought it off Amazon and put one at my desk and put another one at home, at my workspace, um, just to visualize that that stopping point. But it it didn't work. It didn't work. Uh, which is why I, why I started seeking jobs uh, with the federal public defender's office. But um, well, as we get into this, yes. I'll say, um, why don't you tell me a little bit about the experiences you had um, being a, business, um, a female business owner? Ooh, that's yeah, that's that's a hard thing with the old boys club. Of <laughs> so you did, so it's real. You feel it's real. Yeah, it's I still feel. there. Do you, do you I, feel, I feel like in society, um, I remember being younger, yep. like when I was definitely in high school or maybe even in somewhat in college where I felt like, oh, that's a stigma. It's not real. Yeah. Um, and even feminism, I felt like there's no time. need for yeah. that. And um, it really kind of hits you in the face as you get older and then you really see it. And you're um, like, shit, this thing is alive and kicking. Yeah. I, I understand, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of critique out there that, oh, post-feminism, post-racial, right, right. like, get the fuck out of here, we're, we're still very much in it, and we, without a doubt, we have it a lot better than our predecessors oh my did, God, yes. without a doubt, hands down, and we are indebted to everyone who came before us, and so, um, one of my biggest, uh, idols, uh, is, the notorious RBG, <laughs> if you didn't know, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so, uh, you know, I have her book and I watched the documentary a few months ago and I just loved everything about her. Um, I love that she knows that uh, Biggie Smalls was from the Bronx, just like she was, um, or Brooklyn. Um, but anyways, in her book and in her documentary, she was only one of... I want to say like six females in Harvard That's Law amazing. School. Yeah. And so the enrollment rate now for law schools around the country, I believe, is just about 50 50. Wow. It might be even a little bit more, like 51% female. So the future, hashtag the future is female. Um, <laughs> it is true. That is very true. But I, it's still alive and kicking the old, the old boys club. I want you just. Uh touched upon that I almost mm. forgot about is um, when working a wedding, a few times I had an assistant who's not even shooting our, or um, maybe if it was a second photographer that was a male, um, they were my clients and like I tend to like be front and center to do whatever I need to do yeah. and a few, like I would have sometimes wedding guests that would go to the to the other person. Mm. Um, As if he was the main Yeah, one. and like if we were standing next to each other, they would just immediately like yeah. turn to him. And he was younger a lot. Like I've had a few that were definitely younger. Um, so I also thought that was interesting. I well, felt like sometimes. Yeah. It's, just, it's just about. Sometimes not being seen, I think. Yeah, and I that's know. like. I <laughs> again, I am very much a feminist. I had a women's studies minor in college. Um, 
I don't like to be uh, the type of feminist who, again, disparages men because I, I feel like that's not really the true definition of feminism, right? It's supposed to be um, equal opportunities and the equity of the sexes. Uh, but it does enrage me when I feel like there's still that sexism there and it's and it's unspoken and that's why I want to do this podcast and why Nikki and I were doing it previously is that I think the issues need to be addressed it enrages me enrages me when I feel like I'm not being seen or overlooked just because I'm a female and I had that when I was in Texas as well because I was doing a presentation uh, in federal court and there was a certain judicial figure, and of course I'm not going to mention his name. I will just say that it was a male. And uh, I gave the entire presentation myself, was introduced myself uh, solely, me giving the presentation, gave the presentation, did a question and answering section, finished, sat down with a male counterpart, and then our male boss, and we, uh, this male counterpart and I, we were uh, relatively new to the, the Federal Public Defender's Office. And this judge ends up thanking my male counterpart for the presentation. Wow. And then emails him afterwards to thank him for the presentation. Did he say anything? In that Didn't say anything to me. Uh, and the male counterpart actually was like, oh, well, I didn't want to offend him, so I didn't say anything. So I was like, okay, so then you just took credit for my presentation. Are you kidding me? Yeah, no. Yeah. That doesn't... Yeah. Yeah. As if he, like, created it and I was his puppet and he was kind of... Yeah. In the email, did he... No. Nothing. No. Oh, well, it's good that he worked so hard on that presentation. Really nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He turned out... That turned out to be his character, but I digress on that. But um, I think one thing that we were touching upon a little bit is how it might be a combination of both uh, gender as well as age. Yes, actually, and, I, yeah. I and so agree. have you, tell me a, a bit about what you've experienced there. I feel like, have you ever been kind of um, dismissed or overlooked because you were seen as being young and assumed to be in, inexperienced or? Yeah, and I actually think that, um, that definitely affected my pricing as well as my confidence. Um, So one, I think one of the biggest struggles I I had in starting was having confidence in general. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, you're not sort of taught that ahead of time. Like how do you portray yourself? Yeah. And I think that's something that women in general struggle with. Yes. Like how do I appear confident but not... um, Bitchy. Which is, yeah. Yeah. It's what the assumption is, right? Yeah. If you're assertive. I do do feel like with... um, with men, confidence uh, radiates authority. Absolutely. And, uh, for us, it tends to get more of a negative impact. And, yeah. And uh, so I always try to be polite and confident um, and really secure with myself. Yeah. But uh, so that affected me when it came to things like pricing. Yeah. Um, so I had a skill level um, that may not have completely reflected my years of experience. So my. Yeah. Uh, my skill level was far beyond what I had in terms of experience. With, yep. uh, and I felt that I couldn't charge the prices that I really was worth because I needed more time. But yeah. I, I didn't. I was right. running a successful business. I was uh, just chatting with my clients. I was communicating. I was providing them a great quality of work. Right. Um, and really fine-tuning with them uh, images that were really important to them. Yeah. Um, but I felt at the time, sure, you know, like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Uh, but it really wasn't anything but my own confidence that told me right. that. And, and you were 26 when you opened your yes, business, right? Yeah, your which student. isn't even that young, like, really. Yeah, that. but, you know, I feel like in terms of business ownership, you hear, if you were to hear a story, right, about somebody opening their own business at 26 years old, what would you think? Would you think that that was young? I guess maybe hearing a little the story bit. Yeah. About it. Yeah, yeah, because I felt the same way. I opened mine when I was 25, mm-hmm. and I didn't feel like I was not ready. I mean, in terms of, like, the practicalities of running the business, yes, I was not ready. Like, I, I needed help and mentorship with that, and thankfully I had wonderful, actually, mostly all men uh, mentor me about that, and they're, they're all wonderful people and business owners. However, um, 
I didn't think like, oh my God, I'm way too young to start it. But then he, thinking back now and, and saying like, hey, I was 25 when I opened it. I was like, shit. <laughs> like if I went to a if I went to a, a lawyer for help with a major felony and I heard they were 25, I'd be like, fuck you. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to the 50 year old. But I completely agree with you, and it's not. It's not to toot our own horns, but I also at the time knew my value of the work product that I yeah. I had, um, and what commitment I had to my clients and to to their causes and what um, level of effort I was going to put into each and every client's case, uh, and yet my age. And my inexperience at running a business absolutely impacted, I think, for until maybe a couple months before I um, closed my practice. So almost the entire five years, I just completely undersold myself. So, uh, But it is. It's difficult when you – I think you and I had this discussion before. Jennifer Lawrence um, was explaining her – you know, pricing herself for a, a movie, uh, you know, and everyone critiques some some celebrities by saying, hey, how many more millions of dollars do you need? But her point was, well, why shouldn't I be paid the same thing as my male co-star? You know, especially if I have the leading role, right. why shouldn't I be paid the same? And why should I have to um, defer to the studio? Of course the studio is going to pay me as little as possible to get me in. They want to be in and out of there with as, as few costs as possible. So they're, if they can undersell you or underprice uh, you, they will because that's just good business. Yeah. Like, why are you going to overpay somebody if they're willing to accept, you know, $3 million? Why are you going to offer them ten? dollars um, But she said women in general, we are afraid to quote our worth Ask for more. Or ask for more because we'll be seen as as demanding or bitchy or diva or whatever you want to call it. Um, Whereas the men, it's just they're good, savvy businessmen. And I think... Negotiators. Yes. Negotiators. And you touched upon it earlier by saying that we're really never taught that. And it's funny because I I don't know. I don't know where males are like, you know, you know, explicitly taken aside and been like, hey, dude, you, you make sure that you ask for what you're worth. But they do. They they have this, like, bravado that allows them to just be so self-assured. So I actually have to give a lot of credit to my husband for that because he was the one that was really like, if you want to do this uh, and continue doing it, you have to charge enough to be able to pay yourself yeah, you know, pay for future business expenses, uh, pay for upgrading your equipment, pay your taxes. Yeah. Um, and so if you are not charging the appropriate amount, like we won't, you won't be able to continue because you're gonna, yeah. it's gonna, it's gonna cost us money. Way to go, of being Chris! Able. I'm yeah. so proud of you. <laughs> so and and I would have to say, before I was a photographer, he was the one who also pushed me to uh, negotiate for salary. Mm. And um, now when I talk to um, some of my friends, uh, business wise, I will. Especially if they if they're not self employed, I'll be like, you always counter, you always counter. If the worst they say is no, if yeah. they want to hire you, they're gonna hire you, but you counter. Yeah, I, I've, <laughs> I've never countered a day in my life, and uh, and I feel like I've paid for that. But um, you know, I I think that's very true. Like it, I would have never thought. I would have never thought. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You're you're giving me a job. Okay, yeah, no worries. I can pay. Yeah. I can get by on that amount. Yeah. You know, I never. I never thought. I think we do with what we have. Yeah. But I think sometimes if you just reach a little bit more, you know, it'll make your life a little easier. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And maybe you can, maybe you can take the, uh, the rare case where somebody really would love to hire you, but might not financially be able to. Maybe you can choose then those rare cases where you will give someone a break, but you have to be able to, um, to not be scared on a daily basis that you can't pay your bills because you're trying not to be mean and tell people that you need to be paid a fair price. So you actually uh, talked about a couple things that um, also leads us into our next topic, which is um, operating in a saturated market. Yes. And so one of the things that really affected me 
is that, and I think it affects all business owners, and I do think in general all business owners are relatively similar, whether or not they're doing law or they're a photographer or they're doing you know, a fitness project. Um, basically, in the end, uh, I think fear is such a motivator. Oh, yeah. And it's not always the best motivator. No. <laughs> but um, so in operating in a saturated market, um, one of the things that really helped drive me to be fantastic at what I do um, or really give it all my effort was the fear of not booking clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and that also went into me underpricing myself for okay. the first like two to three years. Um, is, you know, someone's going to walk out that door. And I think that uh, the last thing, so I'm talking about in three stages, the last part of that would be um, also equating myself with my work. So if I was not booked, I would would initially think, like, this is a reflection of me and my personality and my art. Oh, yeah, Um, me too, me too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think those those are great points. And it... You know, running a business is not for everyone. And honestly, like I never, before I started mine, I never envisioned myself as a business owner just because I felt like I was more a team player and just wanted to be behind the scenes doing the gritty work and just go home and let somebody else take care of the, the <laughs> management side. But um, I, it's such a freaking hustle especially in a sat- oversaturated market, and there are mostly every market's oversaturated. I think so. yeah. But it's really, um, I think that, or I would like to think, that the more years you are running a, a, a business, um, the less fear-driven you are about where's your next client coming from. But sure. sometimes it depends on your business plan because, you know, when, the, when that recession hit, right around the time I graduated law school, um, there were um, friends of mine who had to go back to working in the mall. You know, Trader Joe's wouldn't hire them because they're like, come on, you're a lawyer, and, like, I'm going to lose you as soon as a a firm job opens up. So why would I waste my time training you? you. Right. So I think when it's it's fear-based, um... You know, it can be scary and you can undercut yourself just to make sure that you're getting some sort of money. But when that uh, recession hit in 2008, um, there were like real estate attorneys trying to practice criminal law. Like, oh literally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just to, yeah, just to make some money because the housing market had dried right, up. Right. So, um, you know, fear can really drive you. So it depends on what, how secure your business plan is and kind of how much um you kind of have uh tucked away for like a rainy day fund of you know am i going to weather through a drought in business for any particular period of time Mm -hmm. and i feel like um you nobody wants to anticipate that but it is it can be very very um likely uh regardless of what market you're in that there might be a rough drought and you have to kind of plan for that and make sure that you know whatever your business model is that you're trying to anticipate that that you're not going to be hanging on by a thread if a a slow month or maybe even a slow year comes about and hits you um but in terms of in terms of the saturated market um how did you decide to try and stand out from the rest because uh, I'd like to hear your experience, and then I'll I'll tell you what mine was because mine took a turn that <laughs> nobody <laughs> nobody in my life would have ever anticipated. Um, so for me, I think um, I noticed a couple things that we sort of talked about uh, a little bit already. So one was there's a lot of older photographers that I think were jaded with the industry, and mm. that, um, they what I saw out of that is they didn't really quite care anymore. You know, it was a job, they were taking it, they were making money, they were, you know, paying off their mortgages. So for me, what I think that showed me is having a type of ideal client actually was important. And every, uh, you know, I was I was trying to take whatever business information I could. And a bunch of people said that, but um, you don't really, like, see it yeah. all the time. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is then start really thinking about, like, what do I need, what do I want to do? Who do I want to work with? What kind of clients do I want to bring in? And what I found is, um, genuinely, I want nice people. Like, 
you know, and it sounds a little silly, but in the end, like, I wanted couples who were really just enthusiastic, about getting married and spending right. this time with friends and family. Right. And to dive in a little bit deeper of that, it's what I mean to say is I wanted clients who really were excited to get married. Yeah. And not necessarily, um, you know, having all the show of it. It wasn't mm-hmm. about the... Yes. Um, the theatrics. Yeah, almost. yeah. It was yeah. really about spending this time together as a couple and experiencing it with their friends and family, yeah. the people who mattered most to them. So what I decided to do is... Uh, the, the photos that gave me joy were the emotional photographs. Mm. And so what I wanted to do is really work at that and make it so that way when you look through your images, it wasn't just a set of pretty pictures. You know, really, we were pulling out personality. We were pulling oh, yeah. out character. We were pulling out, like, the love and connection that you have with your friends and family um, and the connection you have together. So that's where I really started honing, uh, bringing my art and, and showing images that had the emotional impact because I think... In the end, like, um, especially in my situation, so my uh, mother-in-law passed uh, back in April. So the, sorry. Thank you. The first thing we did was we, uh, you know, I got married two years ago, but mm-hmm. it was like, you know, you get dressed up on your wedding day, right. everybody looks beautiful. So we pulled up those images, and, like, it's such a joyous day. And we had these beautiful images of her, and she just was, like, beaming from ear to ear. And, you know, I, I invested in my photographer, I'm a great photographer. Right. And so we, we had these things, and those are the images that we put up, yes. you know, when we did her funeral. Yes. And those are the ones that we're going to put up around the house. Yeah. Um, and, like, you know, for us, it's just, like, I want these images to be important and show the people that are really important to you. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's my... That's beautiful. And you know, <laughs> no, you're so, like, you're going to make me cry, but... I will say, like, it's funny that you say that about bringing out the personality in the couples because every time I see you post a new wedding story and a new um, photo story of a, a another couple that you've shot, I can see that, like, oh, good. immediately. Good, good. Immediately. Yeah. You know, and it's not just the stock, like, oh, the wedding dress hanging in, by the window right, right, and yeah. the shoes set up. Like, there are so many stock wedding photos. And uh, unfortunately, um, my my first marriage, you weren't in business at that time. <laughs> um, and my second wedding, uh, we kind of just um, we just did a, a very much more informal kind of almost right, surprise right. thing. Yeah. Um, but I really wish you could have been there for that one. Um, and I know that you offered, and you're you're amazing. And I wish I could have had you there for it uh, because it is. I think a lot of couples actually mostly the brides um forget about that aspect of the day like really appreciating the day and and what it represents and that it's supposed to be a celebration of love and joining two families together two groups of people together I feel like that should be the time where it's the little moments of um of beauty of the joy from that day or the emotion from that day that really is the are the things the moments that you want to remember not the you know the all the bridesmaids on one side all the grooms then right, on the right, other right. like that's stock the, photos that's the standard photos and like yeah. you know the family photos are really important and we need to take our time with the sure, sure. but like um you know i just i just posted uh, yesterday uh it was the groom um, seeing the bride for the first oh, time. Oh, I saw His that. expression oh, yeah. is just, like, so oh, no. good. I, I, I told, I, I've told people <laughs> this over and over again that I love when a man cries seeing his bride walk down the aisle. Like, I'm yeah. a sucker for that. Right, because right. Because you see this, like, you know, stereotypically heteronormative um, manly man, and then you know he cries because he's so excited. And so it's the it's the, the love is like yes. overcoming oh, him, and yes. you can't. Oh yeah. God, there's nothing better than a man crying seeing as well. I, I think, know that sounds. I think sound family strange, should just cry the whole day. Hell yeah! All day. Hell yeah! <laughs> I am all about that. I I cry at a commercial, um, <laughs> but I I think you do an excellent job, and I think that does stand you apart and make you stand out from so many other stock photographers. Um, well, because you have that heart. Yeah, so that that's actually what I was just about to say, too, is um, so what I think in any business um, that helps set you apart is actually the empathy that you have for your clients. Yes. Um, oh, especially God, yes. something as gut-wrenching as yours, where oh, God, it's like, yeah. you know, you it's it's so much work and so many hours, yeah. um, and you put your heart and soul into this. Yeah. 
And really, like, uh, for me with photography, it's that empathy with that client to really be able to deliver them an image that speaks to them and is meaningful. Right, and to understand what um, what about the day might be the most exciting exactly. part for them, or what about their uh, love story uh, makes them stand out and makes them unique and brings them together. Like, I, I totally see that from your images. Um, well, let me tell you about yours a little bit. Sure, yeah, yeah. I can make assumptions, but I'd love yeah. to hear. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. Um, I don't know. Like anyone, who <laughs> it's a it's a pretty long story, and I'll leave that for the book. But um, I was going to be a prosecutor going into law school, and then halfway through it, I realized how fucked up the criminal justice system is, especially <laughs> towards persons of color yeah. and those of so- lower socioeconomic status. So I decided to go criminal defense. Um, and which is not a glorious work. No, not and you know, my first husband's family are like, uh, he had one uncle who would get drunk on holidays and be like, I think the defense lawyer should get the same sentence that the oh client my God. gets. And yeah, I'm like, oh gee, thanks, Uncle So and So. I'm si- can you pass the the carrots now? <laughs> um, but yes, no, criminal defense lawyers are seen as you know sleazy and disgusting and diabolical and all of that and promoting crime and all of that crap. Um, so that in and of itself, especially coming from, um, you know, my number one hero in life is my father. And so he was a federal agent for over 30 years and I wanted to be just like him. So I wanted to be an FBI agent. He wasn't an FBI, but, um, I wanted to be an FBI agent and then an agent uh, at the Penn State's uh, job fair told me that because my diabetes, I was disqualified. Um, but if I wanted to, I could sue the agency for an exception. Um, and I was like, I'm not doing a, a Serpico type moment where I'm going to be like shot by friendly fire because I yeah. sued my employer. Um, so I was going to be a prosecutor and get the bad guys. And then I realized it's not as black and white as that. And then the first trial that I did with my former boss was a alleged child child molestation trial of the man's daughter, youngest daughter. And it turns out that the wife was using this allegation and kind of brainwashed the daughter into this story to use as leverage in the divorce. Oh my god. Yeah. And uh, and the case was just really crazy, but she had convinced her daughter that um, daddy helping her wipe herself after going number two was actually sexual molestation. So, um, so we did that trial and we did it in front of a judge because when it comes to sex crimes, jurors, t- I've believed, have tended to be a little more on the conservative side where yeah. they'll say, I don't think he did it, but like, let's just be sure. overly cautious yeah. and keep him in jail for a couple decades. So um, we, we did the trial in front of just the judge, and the judge uh, found him not guilty. And so we got his record expunged. You know, there were no longer any, any charges on his record. But he had been on electronic monitoring, home arrest for, house arrest for the last two years, waiting tr- for trial. Um, his entire neighborhood had heard the enough. word, yeah. so thought he was a pedophile. And then, you know, you get to the most heartbreaking part, which is the fact that his two daughters yeah. have been convinced by their mother that, you know, their father is a predator and had abused one of them. So you're never going to have that relationship, relationship with your children again. And you haven't been proven to have done anything wrong. It's just these allegations, you know, and there's not even... It's different from the law and order shows and NCIS and all that stuff. They call it the CSI effect. Prosecutors actually say that uh, during every trial now. They'll say, like, this isn't CSI. We're not going to present you with a ton of DNA evidence and forensic evidence. Right, right. Like, you know, to kind of lower their expectations <laughs> as to the evidence. Um, but it was after that trial where I started looking more and more into the effect of, of allegations of sex offenses and then the consequences of being convicted of a sex offense. And so um, I had left my former employer and teamed up with a friend from law school who had a much different business plan than I did and didn't have the heart. No offense to him. Um, He's a great business person. 
uh, he saw it as a business. He saw criminal defense as a business. So he wanted to get as many um, uh, small, like misdemeanor cases that took maybe one court appearance as to one felony case where you had to go to court like 40 times, you know, but get a, a bigger paycheck where it turns out your billable hours a little bit smaller with the felony because of how much work you have to put in. So he was good with, you know, going to court in the mornings and surfing in the afternoons, like, fine, that's fine. I'm not going to knock it, but that just wasn't my practice. And I mm -hmm. couldn't feel comfortable practicing criminal defense without having my heart in it. And as to your point about the empathy, the, those that I admire the most and my mentors and the people that I've admired have all had that deep, deep sense of empathy. And I think we all can have a little bit more, but it's funny that one of the last conferences I went to for doing um, uh, uh, court-appointed work in Massachusetts uh, before I left for Texas was... Um, a keynote speaker who addressed empathy fatigue, which is a real thing that a lot of criminal defense lawyers get because we mm -hmm. empathize so much and take these cases to home heart. with us yeah. and to heart that we actually get burnt out really fast. Um, but that's how I decided to stand out in an oversaturated market was to become the sex crimes attorney and to become knowledge so knowledgeable in it because I noticed that even some of my mentors didn't want to take those cases. You know, they were mostly males. They had ch daughters of their own. Totally understand. They would never, you know, they couldn't bear to represent someone who was charged with possession of child pornography because they just, all they see is like, oh my God, if it was my daughter, I would like beat the shit out of him. So right. I can't represent him. So at least they knew that about themselves. And they were like, hey, you want the case, you take it. So, um... It's not to say that I didn't empathize with the victims. Um, that's a critique that uh, some state senators uh, and representatives would make when I was testifying on behalf of uh, different nonprofit organizations for criminal justice bills at the state house. Uh, they would essentially say, like, I don't care about the victims, and I'm trying to promote the commission of more sex crimes, but. All it's was, just slander to make Oh, yeah. Bad. It's, uh, you know, all I was trying to do was have a logical, rational, fact-based debate on the issue and to talk about what the consequences can be. So, like, something like a housing restriction, that's fine. You want to tell them they can't live X number of feet from a school, but let's talk about what the statistics say. The statistics say that it doesn't matter so much about the school. It's really about them going outside a, mi a mile past their house so that if they're going to prey on someone, nobody recognizes them from the neighborhood. It's about the fact that something like 93 or 94% of um, sex offenders who offend against children, the child knows the offender right. prior to the incident. So it's not about a stranger lurking at the schoolyard. It's about, you know, the guy who starts dating the single mom and offers to babysit them while mom takes a double shift. It's about the the judo coach. It's about, you know, so it's someone who I mean, has... We've seen a lot of coaches Oh, yeah. Lately. Tons. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, Jerry Sandusky, after I graduated from Penn State. Um, oh, my God. I yeah. Yeah. That, that was a crazy one. Um, so I was trying to be the voice, and I wasn't the only one by, by any means, and especially in Massachusetts. I had so many amazing mentors, but in Rhode Island kind of one of the only ones who had the heart behind it. So I became known as the sex crimes attorney, and then there would be even counselors would refer me to their clients. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing, because, you know, they referred a bunch of homeless clients. My car, you know, offering basically free services that I wasn't offering at the moment, but um, I tried as much as I could to, to do as much pro bono work as I could. Um, but like we talked about, you know, having the balance and there's so many hours in a day. But it made me stand out. And instead of being the 200th DUI attorney mm -hmm. who's just saying, like, come to me, give me 10 grand and I'll get you off, which is totally unethical, but there are those out there that do it. Um, I ended up 
standing out almost like unintentionally because I saw um, some really negative consequences in a particular area of law, some unfair consequences um, that weren't helping society, that were actually potentially endangering society. You know, that housing restriction, a lot of them, there were, in Florida, it's so bad that they would have to live under an underpass of a bridge and it would list it on their state IDs as living under the, the, the overpass of, you know, route whatever. And another one had um, a patch of uh, tents set up in the woods because the woods was the only place in the city where it didn't violate the, the law. And the probation officer would say, okay, you're out of prison. Now uh, go to your tent in the middle of the woods and I'll come out tomorrow and check on you. Like, just insanity. Um, so, and I saw that in Rhode Island because we had such a law and there were um, almost a dozen uh, all men with um, some developmental disabilities that were in an assisted living facility and they were convicted sex offenders and they were 14 feet allegedly too close to the school, although we never found out just how they measured it, whether it was from the whole or Exactly. Um, and yet, outside of their kitchen window was uh, a play school and um, yeah. a daycare center, and it, it had like a, a, a total play area for the kids running around all day right outside their kitchen window, and that didn't violate the law. Um, yeah, that doesn't quite make any sense. Right. So they, there was a reporter who did this kind of expose saying these guys are living too close to the school. So the police, even though they had kind of quietly sent them there, the probation officers had sent them there, um, checked on them, told them it was okay to live there, then told them they had a month to get out or be arrested for another felony, which is failing to register as a sex offender, and it's also considered a new sex offense. So it increases your, your danger to the community, your sex offender level. So um, I was trying to say, like, what would you rather have? Would you rather have them, you know, all in one place, taking their meds, being driven to and from treatment, to and from appointments, the doctors, the probation officers, etc. Or would you rather have them out in the street? Because it was the only one open in the state to them. If they couldn't go to the homeless shelter down the street because it housed women and children and they refused to let sex offenders in, understandably, um, you know, they they w would you rather have them unmedicated, I mean, roaming out, around the woods, that's roaming terrible. around, right? Unable to figure out where they are. So, any, anyways, oh, yeah, kind of a diatribe. Sure taking their medication. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's the bigger thing. Exactly. That gets into some mental health. We could have a whole other discussion. A whole other. We, so. we definitely should, yeah. because I should mention that we're at the wonderful Warwick Public Library recording, <laughs> recording this episode, and, uh, and I am currently reading... Um, an amazing new book that I just checked out a few days ago that the title of it is escaping me, but it is all about mental health in America and the history of um, kind of in incarcerating the mentally ill and the, the revolving door that a lot of mentally, uh, you know, developmentally deficient persons and mentally ill people have uh, with the criminal justice system because we don't them better anyways we should have yeah. that top that discussion but so it sounds like essentially one of the ways that you grew your business is really um specializing in some of the most difficult cases yeah yeah and it wasn't easy and i um you know i had to watch a lot of child pornography to be honest oh my God. i had to part of my job and a lot of a lot of other attorneys i knew wouldn't do it they would basically if you possess at least three or more images then you were guilty so they would go to either the state police headquarters or the FBI um, office and view at least three and then be like, okay, I'm done. But what's really important is during sentencing, especially in federal court, um, they, you can get a sentence enhancement for the number of images, for the type of images, whether there's any you know, sort of BDSM uh, torture, et cetera. So you ha I believe, ethically, it was my duty to, I mean, I'm not watching the whole video. I can kind of click through a couple of clips of it. 
but I want to get a general idea, a general sense of if you're claiming that he has 20,000 images, you know, I, I had one case where I was in there for like three or four hours and it was kind of a cubicle like this and they had cameras looking at me as I looked at the child porn, which was super fucking awkward um, and it made me feel skeevy. But I noticed that like a couple thousand were actually like JPEGs of like the forest, you know, background screensaver type files. Um, and they counted it because they didn't bother to look through all 20,000 images. Um, it was my job because I was depriving my clients of effective advocacy and the best advocacy possible if I didn't get a sense of what the images were. Did I want to watch a cat licking a toddler? Absolutely not. But I had to. So... I would speak to FBI agents, and, and a lot of times in, in any kind of law enforcement um, facility, they would kind of, <laughs> poor bastards, they would designate a, a male or a female law enforcement agent to kind of be the go-to person who would get these cases. And so I spoke to one female FBI agent, and she was like, yeah, I've been doing this seven years, and I'm completely burnt out. And I totally got it. I totally understood it. Because while, you know, I, I'm certainly not saying that all of my clients were um, guilty of the crimes they were alleged to have commit or have committed, but um, damn if it isn't uh, hard to watch child porn and look at color photographs of dead bodies, you know, with bullet holes in them, that it, it can take a lot out of you. So... I did, you know, I made that decision and uh, I feel like I made a good impact and I know that there are others that made an even greater impact and still do, um, but it's a hard, it's a hard way to make a living. It's not, you know, that's why I say my former partner, he, maybe he ha had a better idea, but you know what, in my opinion, in my opinion, he's going well, to sleep at night. Exactly, <laughs> not woken up to, to terrors, but, you know, somebody's got to do it. And there's got to be somebody that does the heavy lifting. So um, you sort of, from my understanding, mm -hmm. uh, not being a lawyer, so the two things that I wanted to bring up with that is, um, one, it's the idea that uh, what is, so some of your clients, I imagine, had some pretty severe mental health issues. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't think most people that, you know, I would, I would expect, like, a uh, medication and a therapist um, could probably go a long way. Um, and the Absolutely. other thing is, actually, what is the role of prison in situations like this oh, where we cannot take someone and throw them away for the rest of their life and just pretend they don't exist? Um, so really it's about, like, how to integrate someone into a community, even someone as terrible as a, um, a child molester. Right. So if those people are able to function in society with medication and therapy, um, I think you know, being able to, and I think some of those, some of those clients probably recognized that they had a problem, didn't know. Yes, and there were, there, and, but to probably most people's surprise, far fewer than, than society would have you think, um, you know, everyone assumes if someone has committed child molestation that they are a pedophile, mm -hmm. and uh, pedophilia is a diagnosed medical condition, mental health condition. And uh, not every person who committed child molestation yes, had that. pedophilia. No, uh, that, yeah. yeah, and uh, and that's uh, that can be a whole another topic for another episode. But there's um, in Massachusetts there's civil sex offender civil commitment, which means after your criminal sentence has run out, if they find that you're too dangerous to society, they can civilly commit you. Your your quote unquote. They don't call it a sentence, but you're issued uh, a duration of, quote-unquote, one day to life. Yeah. So they pretty much keep you in there, and every couple of years they'll give you a review of whether you've made any progress. Um, but for the most part, no, they're, they're, the mental health aspect of it um, wasn't for every person who had been convicted of a sex crime. But um, even for non-sex crimes, you know, I, I touch upon this in, in the book a bit, but there was one poor client who actually um, was a paranoid schizophrenic and 
Um, his family just didn't know what to do for him anymore because they had been living with this for a number of years. And every time he went off his meds, he would, you know, end up committing a crime and then be brought into jail and so, uh, or prison in this case. And so I went to the prison one time and the, uh, uh, the, the employees there knew that I liked to go on Sunday mornings because it was a lot faster to get in and out because there were no other attorneys going in there. <laughs> they were their clients then. But when a, uh, I went one time and they were like, oh, you can't go see your client. And I said, why? And they said, well, he's uh, on suicide watch in the medical unit. And I said, mm, okay. And they kind of um, chuckled. And then the next time I came back and they were like, oh, you're here to see so-and-so? And I was like, uh, yeah, asshole, let me go see him. And so when there seemed to be a danger to themselves or others, um, sometimes they're held in the, in the hospital ward. So there was a few times where I went, was brought up there, and they took me in to see him in an exam room and shut the door and had him sitting at a door, at, at a chair right at the door, and had me seated on the opposite side of the room in the doctor's chair, That's weird. and so in order for me to leave the room, had to I had to pass him, and he uh, came on to me, and uh, that proposed, seems like a gross overstep on their part. Yep, proposed to have sex on the patient bed right next to him, and uh, I politely and firmly and immediately turned him down and tried to redirect his conversation uh, to the to the charges at hand, and but then I had to leave the room, and in order to do that, I had to pass him. So that was one of one of my more uncomfortable moments in the jails and prisons that I frequented. Um, but another time, after he was done with suicide watch, they put him in seg in segregation, and so when you have client visits, uh, they'll normally bring them down to a visiting room. But if they're in SEG, you usually have to go up to SEG to visit them. And they are put in a cage and then inside a room. And then uh, you can sit on the other side of the cage and talk to them. So I went to go see him uh, a little while later. And it took a full year for me to get him, instead of um, a criminal uh, a period of incarceration, uh, to get him into an inpatient facility. It took me at least a year to, to get the court to agree and to get an inpatient facility to, to take him. So one time I went, and they were laughing, and they were like, yeah, we found him smearing his, uh, his feces all over the wall and drinking his toilet water. And, and they were laughing. And I, and I was so angry, so angry, that they had such lack of empathy that they could be chuckling at this man being so mentally ill that he was using his feces as like paint and drinking toilet his toilet water. Um, and in this book that I'm reading, she looks at the LA County Jail because they have a large hospital unit in there. Um, and they talk about the fact that the Correctional officers, they really don't have training in being mental health uh, workers. And so there is a, a, a bit of a bit of understanding in that they're not trained to deal with these kinds of issues. But in my opinion, even if you're not trained to it, and even if it's a heavy issue and you don't want to take it too much to heart, you don't fucking laugh at it. Um, so it... It was very difficult because then you also have an obligation to make sure if your client makes any kind of legal decision in court that he's mentally competent to do so. So it's your obligation as an attorney to decide whether he's of right sound body and mind to enter into a decision. Um, yeah, we can have a whole another episode. There's an issue of like forced medication and then whether you can force a person and whether that violates their constitutional rights, but then how do you know if they're, they would, in their right mind, quote-unquote, want to refuse medication because they're not in their right mind and you need the medication to get them there. And so it's 
So in you explaining all of this, Mm -hmm. it seemed like the obvious question would be, how did you navigate your clients and their view of you and even Mm. working with them as a woman when most of the time the clients were... They were were alleged sex offenders, yeah. Exactly. That's a great question. And um, and I'll say I was uh, uh, come on to by a couple of clients. Unfortunately, not too, too many, and most were professional. Uh, But not all of them were charged with sex crimes, so... That's a whole other issue, uh, and dealing with clientele who can be incredibly disrespectful is very difficult. But I'll tell you, on the for the majority of my clients, they were actually extremely respectful towards me, mm-hmm. and I think part of it is not being scared by like you know, there would be oftentimes I would be meeting with a client in the prison, and uh, other prisoners would be being ushered by to go to, like, say chow, go eat lunch. And we would be sitting in the room, maybe the door's open, and so these, you know, 50, 60 inmates would be walking by and some would catcall me. You know, as a woman, you have to present yourself in such a way that you are not showing any vulnerability and not being rattled by someone doing that because if you're seen as being vulnerable, then they're going to do it's it. It's opportunity. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that was something that I initially had to learn to do pretty, fit, pretty fast. Um, but it's also, if you're respecting your clients, they're much more likely to respect you back. Mm-hmm. So... Um, I feel like I had a really good rapport. Some of my most respectful clients were convicted of some of the most heinous offenses. That's interesting. I had, you know, someone with a pretty high body count treat me very, very respectfully and, uh, you know, always never say Kate, even though I would encourage my clients to call me by their first name, um, by my first name. Uh, you know, always Mrs. Godin or Attorney Godin, you know, it was, it was interesting. Uh, but I feel like when you have, when you're the best person or the most likely person to be able to get them a shorter sentence or a not guilty verdict or treatment or whatever it is, if you're the most likely person to do so, they're gonna, they have more of an incentive to treat you with respect. Mm-hmm. At least while that um, possibility is still out there. You know, maybe after the, the trial's over and they're pissed off, they respond differently. But while they still have that opportunity where I can help facilitate whatever they're looking for, whatever outcome they're looking for, they're incredibly respectful for the majority of them. And sometimes even the most um, mentally ill, you know, you have to treat them with respect um, and not be condescending, but some of them were incredibly respectful and wonderful people, honestly. And I I still, you know, one of my clients ended up passing of liver failure um, a couple years after I moved to Texas, and his mother called me and let me know, and it was really hard for me. It was really hard for me. Like, I've gone to a client's wake before. I imagine when in some of these cases, you have really intimate relationships with Yeah, them. you spend a lot of time, you know, you are really, besides, like, maybe a priest, you know, you, you know the nitty-gritty. Because yeah. you have to have that trust in order to do your job properly. Is that why you asked to be referred to as Kate? In, yes. Honestly, um, well, also because, you know, I, I had, like, a... When I was working for a firm, <clears throat> I had the firm's manager tell me, like, oh, always introduce yourself as attorney, go to an attorney. Make sure when you speak to anyone on the phone or the court or whatever, you tell them it's attorney. And I'm like, all right, come on. Like, I don't need to be that in your face about it, really. But, um, yes, I, I even dressed down in the office. I would very rarely, if I didn't have to go to court, wear a suit. I would have a suit at my office in case I needed to go to court or to a police station. But I would usually wear like a sweater and jeans 
and a lot of clients respond to that very positively, saying that they felt more comfortable in IEs because it was almost like the the relationship was more equal, mm-hmm. and it wasn't this very um, authority figure. Oh yeah, yeah. So if I'm gonna ask you like mm-hmm. how many plastic bags you fucked in the oh. you know <laughs> dumpster that got you picked up for your latest sex crime, like we we better be on pretty good terms. Well, I also imagine that, um, so let's say you have a high percentage of clients that have mental health issues, they probably aren't able to get attention or seek medical attention yep. because they're not on the highest social economic right. status, Absolutely. in which case if you show up uh, in a, a fancy suit, they're sort of looking at you like, how can you possibly relate to my situation? Absolutely. So I think that's a smart move. Thanks. Thanks. I I feel like I was comfortable with it. Good. So, um, but on your end, being a a photographer, you know, kind of documenting a client's or the client's uh, one of their happiest days, hopefully. I I feel like our type of work is both emotionally exhausting, but for very different reasons. (laughs) (laughs) So do you have, do you tend to have like a lot of demanding clients? Um, So I think what I've really tried to do is build a business that reflects the type of clients um, that I both um, relate to and want to work with. And in general, I think they really hold me to a high standard when it comes to the art, mm. but when it comes to recognizing that I'm a person and um, they are really much more down to earth and uh, reasonable, and what I try to do and what any business I would really suggest is set expectations mm. and adhere to them. Yes, um, so absolutely. So don't, uh, don't say you're going to deliver the world and then just come up with a couple. Oh, I couldn't agree um, more. So really, and that has to do with me understanding my limits yep. uh, and being able to communicate that. And I think just having very honest, open communication the yes. whole way is really important. Um, and I'm sure you do the same when you're sort of... Oh, yeah. About. You can't. You cannot give them false hope. You cannot... It's almost as very simple and what some might consider um, insignificant as when you'll call them back oh my God, or, yeah. or when you'll come out and see them. If you tell them, I'm going to come out tomorrow and see you, and you don't come out, there's going to be like a report to the, to the ethics board that you, you know, are defunct in your duties. Um, in fact, um, AVO or AVO, I, I never remember how they pronounce it, but there is a website, and I think it's now for doctors and lawyers, but it used to be just specifically for lawyers to rate them and have them answer questions and things. And uh, w- one of my clients, I never asked them to, re- to review me because obviously for confidentiality reasons and, <clears throat> you know, I feel like that was an imposition given the, the nature and sensitivity of my work. But one client chose on a non-sex crime to r- rate me and review me and he said one of the most amazing things was if she told you she was going to call you back in 15 minutes, you were getting a call in exactly 15 <laughs> minutes. I never um, overbooked. I never scheduled appointments that I knew I probably wouldn't make it back from court in time for. Mm-hmm. I always, and that was the, the benefit of, well, you know, it's also working 16-hour days, but that was the benefit of being my own uh, business owner was that I could do that. You yeah. know, public defenders don't have that opportunity. They don't have that um <clears throat> excuse me, ability to uh, set times to, to see clients and to pace it out in such a way that they're never going to be back-to-back or in the waiting room for more than two minutes. Um, you know, their caseload is just too overwhelming. But for me, I always ran it where I devoted the time that I needed to that client and really made sure that I respected their time as much as I asked them to respect mine. Um, exactly. I think that it was some part of reciprocity. Thank yeah. You. Thank yeah. You. Um, yeah, I think and uh, I I feel like I need to take a little bit of time so weekends are off. I know a lot of times I'm That's working great. the weekend. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, and then mm-hmm. otherwise uh, trying to I say like um, between emails and phone calls, I try to do it within 48 hours um, mm-hmm. to make sure that they get some type of response. Right. But yeah, I think 
you know, the management and the expectation is the most important for any business. Absolutely. I couldn't to I maintain couldn't and decide. have a yeah. client. Which also brings me to the next thing is um, your hustling. So oh, how, yeah. do you, how to hustle with uh, building that business and yeah. establishing that name. So how, how did you sort of navigate that, especially in the earlier days? Yeah, I know. Because I'm a little bit older than you. And uh, like a year. <laughs> but, um, no, I was I was kind of operating at a time where social media wasn't as big. Like I started in two thousand nine, and <clears throat> excuse me, I think in two thousand five I joined Facebook. But you that was at a time where they it was only if you had a valid college address, mm-hmm. so it wasn't even open to. Oh my God, I was public. thinking of that the other day. Yeah, and all right? the college Facebook photos are yeah. gone. I think Facebook got rid of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. My first photo is definitely not my first photo. It's like from law school, yeah. whatever. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> I digress. But um, it was at a time where the internet wasn't as important as it is nowadays. Prominent. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I did everything I could think of. I bought books on search engine optimization. So before I paid a friend to do my website, revamp my website, I I used WordPress. I created my own. I um, figured out how Google and other uh, search engines uh, have their algorithms to rank a website and, like, rank its prominence. So basically coding um, behind your website's page, the, the invisible stuff, um, so that it will rank you higher, so that you'll be on, like, page one of the search results if you type in Rhode Island criminal lawyer. Mm-hmm. Um, so knowing what what terms people are most likely to type in. Like, it's, it's different, because now it, for Instagram, like, you type in hashtag, you know, the future is female, and you get to find out how many other people have done, use that hashtag. So you, you you can check and see whether if you um, pluralize something, it's going to be more more uh, prevalently searched than the singular form. Mm-hmm. So um, this might be a little too intricate of a discussion, but uh, and I had no again no desire to know this stuff in the beginning, but I had to I had to because I was like I'm not I'm not you know that phrase you gotta make uh, you gotta make it. Well, but also you have to um, spend money to make money. Oh, yes, 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 yeah. Which is true. I'm not, which is true. <laughs> Absolutely true. I am way too cheap to have ever fully bought into that mindset. So oh, I yes, yes. was scraping by any chance I could, like, undercut one of my operating costs. I was doing it. Yeah. Like, instead of having a fax line, I paid 10 bucks a month for myfax.com and would have it anytime um, someone would fax my fax number it would electronically be sent to my email by PDF. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could view it in court. You know, things that made it easier so that I never had any support staff. I'm not advocating for this for any of you. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> if, if you can afford support staff, do it. Do it. Yeah. But um, but I just chose uh, my business plan was never. Business. Well, I think there's a big difference between uh, spending money recklessly. So True. I guess I, you have to uh, invest in yourself and your business in yes. order to actually um, turn a profit. Right. But um, doing so responsibly and irresponsibly makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. And so knowing that you could pay for a fax line as opposed yeah. to investing at that time. I mean, yeah. how much were those things? Pretty yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, 10 bucks a month. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't even think about Because it would have had to be a separate landline. Yeah. So you would have had to pay that monthly fee. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it is. It's about figuring out, being smart with your money. Yeah, exactly. Like you said, not reckless, but being smart with your money. So that was part of my hustle. The other part was getting over, I don't want to say bragging about myself, but sometimes if you've ever heard that, like, sometimes the most effective commercials are the most annoying ones. True. What makes you think of them? So yeah. it's not so much about whether it's a good commercial or a fun commercial or something that makes you smile. You could be annoyed as shit about the jingle or the ad. The ad doesn't even have to fucking make sense. But if you can remember <laughs> that it's for you Geico, made an impact. they're gonna when you think of insurance, you're gonna go your thoughts gonna go right to Geico. So for me, I had to get over. Um, you know, Facebook didn't really have 
business pages at the, at the beginning, but then towards the end of owning my firm, it did. So I had I ran those pages. But in the interim, I was posting a lot on Facebook, and I was posting a lot of um, interesting articles about like someone who got arrested for something crazy or an interesting issue that came up or, you know, um, I would also blog about it. And in fact, when the first transgendered female uh, was housed in the Massachusetts um, Civil Commitment Center for sex offenders, Mm -hmm. uh, she was asking to obviously be housed with females because she identified as female, and she was also asking for hormones, and she was like, look, I I do remember this case. Yeah, I did not ask to be civilly committed. I, it is past my criminal sentence, so you can't deprive me for the rest of my life of my hormones. I have severe depression if, I, if I'm not on them. And so the issue was whether the state, the Commonwealth, should have to pay for that. And the other issue, the bigger one, was that there aren't enough, there aren't enough female sex offenders to actually house them separately. Sense. So the question was, like, where do we put her? Um, so I had blogged about it on my website. A, a reporter from the Associated Press called me, and she was like, so do you, and this was well before Laverne Cox and Caitlyn Jenner, and so um, the issue of transgendered and transsexual people uh, was still very much not talked about that much. Um, and so this reporter called me up and she was like, so how much of your practice do you devote to representing transgendered individuals? And I was like, well, I don't actually dedicate or focus any of my practice towards representing transgendered or transsexual individuals. I'm not um, selling myself as, uh, you know, advocating for their, for their civil rights. I don't, I actually don't know enough about that law to, to suggest that I could represent them well enough. Um, I just blogged about it, but she, she assumed because when she went to go look for that case, my website came up that I somehow was either representing a woman or very interesting. Yeah. You were just trying to educate the public. I was trying situation. to educate the public and also keep my website active, keep my blog a- active, and keep... It's an interesting subject for sure. It's, oh, completely. Um, and of course, I'm a, oh, I'm a bleeding heart liberal, so of course it tugged at, at my heartstrings, and, and I'm <clears throat> a, a very big uh, advocate for uh, the LGBTQ plus community. But... Um, you know, it just didn't happen to be what my practice was about, but it was funny that she assumed it because I had blogged about it. Um, but it happened a, a few times where I would talk about an issue and the website would, like, come right to my page instead of more, awesome. more credible sources. Um, but it, it was really about also keeping my name and what I did present in my social media community's mind. Mm -hmm. So there were a ton of people over the years, you know, obviously I'm not naming any names, but there may or may not have been prior classmates of mine from different periods in my life who may or may not have come to me. And just by remembering through Facebook that that I was a lawyer, came to me and asked me to represent either them or their family member or whatever. Mm -hmm. So... How about you? It's good that you say that because I think when I first, the first uh, two, three years, I think I was in business, um, Facebook was really starting to pick up. Mm-hmm. Um, it had opened up to uh, the rest of the population right. and um, parents and their parents are on Facebook. So um, then they had to create other things that were cool, <laughs> cooler so that the old people didn't see what they were up to. Right. So, um, and it, the nice thing was, um, I felt like it did get me in touch with a lot of, um, it got me clients that I had, uh, not kept up in touch with from high yeah, school. Yeah, so absolutely. I, um, I worked with, and even some, some, uh, some girls, mainly brides end up getting in touch with me more so than grooms, but they, um, knew that I was in business, were able to see the quality of the work. And um, knew me from high school, and I mean, hopefully, 
it showed I wasn't an asshole because <laughs> they reached out. Yeah. Um, and said, well, people know, can change from what they were were in high school as well. But I would well, never they had, imagine they had be an asshole. Reasonable yeah. thoughts about yes. me because yeah. I wouldn't have called some people that I knew back then. Yeah, but, um, definitely. Yeah, so it got me in touch, and I actually um, photographed with some people that I wouldn't. You know, we weren't even in the same social circles, right, but it was really right. nice to get to know them that way. Yeah. Um, after high school, which was yeah. kind of cool. Um, and then after that, what I really found is uh, networking was so difficult for me. I went from, I mean, I actually think in sixth grade, so I was new to school. Um, I don't think I talked for almost a full year. Oh my gosh. I know. I was so shy. Aww. And um, I have two older brothers, so eventually they beat that out of me. Pretty Excellent. Much. Um, Good job, guys. I mean, not food, not food. food. <laughs> <laughs> Just clarify that. <laughs> But um, they worked it out of me, yep. and um, so I had to be front and center, and it made me so nervous to have to go and talk to, especially starting out, people that I didn't know, oh, yeah. and start conversations with them, yep. and I'm not, I don't consider myself a conversationalist. I um, think you're a great conversationalist. It's funny that you say that, because normally I'd be like, no, I'm going to hide under this blanket. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but every time we, we connect, we talk nonstop, and very, very um, fast pitches, if you guys haven't noticed that we might be talking very, very, very fast, because we tend to do that, because whenever we catch up with one another, we have hours and hours, hours of things. Hours and conversation. Yeah. Um, so it was intimidating, yeah. and um, I felt difficult, but extremely important, and I felt like um, now I see the results of those hours of networking. Um, and ideally, what I just tried to do is just find people that I could actually have a genuine relationship with. That's it great. wasn't about brand raising. Yep. In the end, um, it was about connecting with other people in the industry who also want to deliver quality products to people um, that they felt were important and cared and cared about their businesses. That's so important. Um, yeah. So. Because you can you can reciprocate, and and for me, I never felt I ha- I always felt it had to be organic. Yes. So if I was going to suggest someone to to someone I knew, especially if they were friends or family, you'd be sure that I was not just doing it to like throw them a bone back because oh, yeah, they had no, given no. me a case. And yeah. It, yeah, but it's it's hard it's hard to do because there are, and I think we should um, maybe talk a little bit about that. And I'd like to ask you of. of because the last time that you and I met privately, we talked about you know female. Mm-hmm. Uh, professional groups and networking groups um, or the lack thereof but for me it's same thing like oh you know being an athlete and you were an athlete as well but for me being um, in the news um, for track and field um, and being interviewed by reporters that got me a little bit more used to it so I had a little bit of a head start and then when I had to do public speaking and college I was like oh okay I I basically have no shame (laughs) so that helps um and then you know when I once I had to do trial advocacy in law school and I fucking loved it but there were classmates of mine who were like oh my god this is the worst experience ever because you have to be in front of a room of people it makes you vulnerable yes and you know not a lot of people want to open up and or push past that vulnerability or push past that fear. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's another motivator right there. Um, your fear. Your yeah. fear of uh, rejection oh, and yeah. failure is so high. So I think it can stop a lot of people from being successful. Yeah, dead in their tracks. Dead yeah. in their tracks. But you have to, you know. And that's why, like I said, I don't think running your own business is for everyone. Nor should it be, you know. That's true. I, yeah. You know, I think it's... It might come out of necessity for some people. Um, maybe they can't find a job and they have to do it. But for those of you who might be um, considering whether to go out on your own, consider whether your personality is conducive to it, you know, because you do. You have to put in a lot of hours of, I joined a couple networking groups, some of, and I am not a schmoozer. Oh, my God. <laughs> and that was, that was so hard for me in law school because, no offense to my law school or my colleagues um but a lot of it's like playing golf don't play golf uh i may not have had the same interest yeah Yeah. um a lot of it is like you go you pay 50 bucks and you get free beer or wine i didn't drink either beer or wine at the time i was networking so i basically to be paying to be able to be in the room with these people and then 
oh, it was very clicky. And then a lot of it was, what can you do for me type of thing. Oh, and so yeah. I was actually in D.C. in my law school. Um, one of the alumni had uh, hosted a gathering for those of us who are going to be inducted into the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court's bar, so to be able to practice in front of the Supreme Court. So we got That's excited. Yeah, it was really fun. I, it was really cool. I got to see RBG from just a few feet away. <laughs> um, but we were at this thing, and there were some kids that act, I was going to say kids, but they were law students, so they were obviously adults. And they had um, gone from Rhode Island to D.C. just to go to this event to be able to schmooze with potential employers. And so one kid came up to me, and he was like, oh, yeah, I want to do maritime law. And I was like, oh, yeah, my friend is out in California doing that right now. And he's like, oh, what's his name and contact information? And I gave it to him, and then he was like, okay, thanks, bye. Ouch. And I was like, Jesus Christ, douche. Like, that's why I hate coming to these fucking things, because it's all about, like, it's a transactional thing. So as you can see, I am not the most polished person and have a bit of a potty mouth. So I don't always represent in the highest socioeconomic status group gatherings, um, which a lot of lawyer bullshit happens at. So, and being criminal defense, we're kind of like looked down upon because we're like the lowly people. We're not like the corporate lawyers with the big, you know, six-figure salaries. So um, a lot of that was very inorganic to me and so I it was it's an inorganic yeah. situation in yes. which case they're expected to make an organic relationship yeah so it's extremely difficult yeah um but I mean I do think there are this is one of the there I, I've definitely made some great connections um I actually do now work with a wedding planner um one or two times a year she's fabulous and she gives everything to her business that's and, wonderful um, I met her at one of the networking things. Great. Um, and, you know, some great floors. I've definitely met some wonderful people in the industry. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you kind of have to search for them sometimes. Yeah, you know? it is. It I feel like when you're new, you don't feel. Oh, now okay. when I go to a networking event, it's almost like just catching up with your friends yeah. and seeing what's going on. But when you get started, you're like, I don't even know where to begin. Right. I'm just going to drink this Coke in the corner and yeah. eat something off the table. Yep. Um, but I think the more you put yourself out there, the more you uh, increase the odds that you will make a connection, right. a genuine organic connection with yeah. someone who feels and, the same way. And maybe not even um, going up to them as that one law student did and, like, suck me for the contact information and then leave me. Does he not realize that you could have just called your friend and be like, yeah, don't do that? I know, right? <laughs> I should have. Oh, my God, I should have. I never even thought that I should do that. I'd be like, hey, watch out for this asshole. Um, but... I, I think it's it's just approaching somebody else and being like, hey, hi, how are you? What's your name? What do you do? Oh, I do this. And maybe not even, like, you know, immediately be like, here's my business card. Make sure you call me if anyone gets arrested. Like, right, right. you know, like you said, being organic and just developing and seeing if there's an actual authentic connection and then getting to know them and their business practices a little more. Exactly. And, it's and almost really the follow-up it. is even yes, more important. Exactly. Yeah, so if you have that 10-minute conversation at that event right. and you feel like you get along really well and you're right. excited to learn more about them, then you get that business card and you go home and you send an email later and be like, I'd love to take you out for coffee and, yeah. and chat more. And um, from there, you can sort of develop that relationship a lot more. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think th those are great tips. Now, uh, in terms of female networking, have you felt like there's an there could be stronger connections and networking networking opportunities for women in business? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so out of the moment, I would say a lot of the networking uh, events that I go to, I think the industry, um, weddings in general, are just higher and bigger in general. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is there is a little bit of a generational uh, difference, in which case I notice the uh, some of the individuals that are in the industry longer, they might be burnt out. Mm -hmm. And they don't... They don't um, really give a shit to network. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so they're not really interested in developing relationships, um, whereas the younger individuals, they're interested in helping and meeting and connecting and collaborating. Right. Um, but I would say, so leave the older, bitter people alone. Yeah. And, um, You'll be able to spot them pretty fast. Pretty quickly, yeah. yeah. Um, but I would say that uh, something that I did find that was really helpful for me is when I 
my very first year as an internship for another woman photographer, and she's fantastic. And she was so helpful in mentoring me to get me where I need to be. Yeah. And I can accredit so much of my business awareness to right. that help. Um, so I do try to pay it forward with other women um, because I think in the end we all suffer from very similar fears or sure. um, motivations. You know, like putting, putting some dinner on the table right. is important and right. paying your mortgage or yeah. your rent or whatnot. And then, you know, the fear of being insecure and unwanted and not having work that's good enough is so strong. Or not um, having the experience at running the practice. or Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, in the end, like we were saying, you know, the communication was so helpful with building yeah. client relationships and expectations and like those basic business uh, fundamentals I think yeah. are just important for everyone. And they're, and they're worth... They, they're there repeating because, and as funny as it sounds, like a lot of people, even though it seems very commonsensical, like a lot of people don't seem to have gotten a memo. Yeah. Not to be a dick. Right. Like, not, right, to, right. not to be like a blowhard who's just going to suck you dry and then spit you back out. Yeah. So to be gracious, to be respectful, to not... Um, you know, to not look at your elders as if they're old and tired and by the wayside, and so you're just going to come in and show them how much better you are than them, you know, um, in a very respectful way. You can uh, try and take very helpful wisdom and years of experience and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, fables as well as success <laughs> stories so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that they might have had to go, to go through on their own. I can't, you know, I remember in sixth grade, our teacher had asked us, like, do we think, she had asked the classroom, um, do we think that we can learn from other people's mistakes? And I was, like, one of the only students. And I was like, yes, absolutely. I have two older brothers. And yeah. I look at them all the time and I say, don't do that. If you're going to do something like that, do it this way. So, um, yes, absolutely. And I think... One of the good things is if photographers in general, um, they have a very good referral network. And yeah, it's basically, you know, we can only take one job a day. If we're doing more than one job a day, we may not be the best photographer. Right. Um, but we can only devote that energy to that client. So when we have um, multiple inquiries for these dates, then we typically send them to people whose work we respect and um, admire. And we also feel like they treat their clients well So because we're giving that recommendation. Right. So we refer each other a lot. And I think having a network of people that you can talk to um, about potential problems or yes. about concerns or fears, um, then that's really important. I actually have... Um, another photography friend, um, she pretty much started her business about the same time as me, and we frequently um, chat about, you know, how do I respond to this email, how do I set these um, limits, um, and then, you know, how do I give more, even. Right. Um, so she's been instrumental. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and really building my business, um, and I think we've mutually helped each other quite a bit. So. Yeah, shout out to Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that that is a really um, important thing to emphasize is you have to ask questions. You have to not be afraid or oh, yeah. too prideful to ask questions. Don't be afraid of how you're going to come off. Just yeah. ask the question. And you and I were chatting right before the podcast about <clears throat> my, um, you know, greatest fear in in running my practice and that was that I was going to fuck up somebody's life. <laughs> Not a little fear, you know. It's a very practical oh, Yeah, yeah, no, just, a, just a little little scare. Um, and that's, I mean, yes, you have, you have liability insurance for a reason and everyone's human, everyone's going to make mistakes. That's why when there's uh, a claim against a criminal defense attorney, it's called uh, ineffective assistance of counsel and it's actually a constitutional um, term that came from the Supreme Court. There's a standard that has to be proven in order to say that your your attorney was that bad, um, that that you deserve some sort of remedy. Um, it's different for when you're like suing some an attorney civilly and you want money from them. Usually, my clientele they just wanted to get out of prison or, or get a new trial. So, um, but it petrified me. Petrified me constantly that I would fuck something up and so one thing that I learned and that even the head of the ethics bar in the, or the board 
in Rhode Island told a group of us was if you're the if you're one of the ones worrying, you're probably good. Like you're that you're doing sense. you're caring enough. Yeah. If you care enough that you're gonna fuck up, then <laughs> you're, you're probably gonna, gonna do the work so that you know you have a smaller chance that you're gonna fuck up. So um, that was really what scared me. And what helped me get over it was just being able to tell a client, I don't know. If they ask me an, a question and I do not know the answer, don't fucking fake it till you make it. Especially in something as in serious law. as that. Yeah, in yeah. law. Maybe yeah. some other practices you can get away with it. Um, but for any lawyers out there who are advising clients, know that they're going to remember words that you say. They're going to misremember things that you tell them. So it is vitally important that if they ask you a question and you don't know, you don't have to say, like, get the fuck out of here, I don't know. You can say, like, I'll look into that for you. Or I'm not sure because I don't have I don't focus on that area of law, but here's the name and number of an attorney that I believe could help answer your question. So I think in every business it's really important to swallow your pride and ask questions you yeah. hey we've got the internet now we can so we can research stuff we can buy books we can go to the library like this one one of the tangents to that is i think when you're a um, small business owner mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're a solo entrepreneur it right. is very lonely yes um so a lot of times like having that network and that connection um or just a friend um Who's, yeah, yeah. Who's gonna, who can listen to you and help you. And, and sometimes it's literally just listening to you. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and my, my husband, uh, my husband, I have to give him a lot of credit. Uh, he thinks I don't give him any credit. Anyways. Chris, she does all the time. <laughs> I got to defend her on that one. I love you. <laughs> she loves you. She always gives you a shout out. Um, but he was he was really helpful about really especially in the early days of like how do I do this, um, how do I put you know how do I do everything? Right. And I kind of had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. It started from scratch. Yeah. Um, and and so I just think you know, and that's also partly why I try to reach out now to I, I, I make the wonderful. case more uh, female entrepreneurs. Yep. Um, I feel like you got to pick a specialty, so you just go yeah. in a group and you, you do can't it. Help everyone. Um, so I would, of course, help any. I would help anyone if they ask, but I, right. I feel like for women, um, just a few more uh, things along the way that make it a little bit more difficult. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I try to when I see an opportunity to give some help or advice. Sometimes it might not be warranted, but I really I do it in a way that's very nice. And well, just joining me on this podcast is <laughs> very nice, and I really appreciate you you coming on and. And talking about this because I think, at least, that it is going to help uh, alleviate a lot of people's concerns or maybe reassure them or give them a little bit more confidence. I to, hope, yeah. Yeah, and, and to reach out to people with more knowledge or experience because that's, that's kind of what life's about, right? It's right. kind of um, sucking dry every ounce of knowledge and past experience like you learned so quickly and knew by the sixth grade like history repeats itself so you better learn from others mistakes before you make the same exact ones you don't need to reinvent the wheel either yeah you know and I think that's really important my one of my biggest mentors and help starting out was John Grasso hey hey Grasso and uh he made a deal he was like I will sublet your office space for you and you can pay me back in hours that you work for me and if you can make the rent one month you don't have to work for me at all nice. but if you don't right yeah, we were super great. helpful yeah. and then he set me up with all the people that helped him start his practice um you know he always gave me advice he gave me um templates for like uh engagement letters to, to sign a contract with the client uh, for representation, you know, it was, it, it was, he was so helpful, and I'm so indebted to him, and I, and I did also try to, you know, kind of give advice to any young law students, I would give talks at the school, and I would um, take on uh, 
unpaid interns, but I didn't really ask them for any work. I just mm-hmm. actually, it was more of them observing my practice and I would teach them what I was doing so that they would understand because in law schools, they never really have like a, a business class. Oh, yeah, I feel like most you know? schools yeah. the one piece and like that'll yeah. make or break you is you know understanding to, some fundamentals right. in business. You know how to think like a lawyer, but you don't know how to run your own firm. You don't yeah. know where to buy your staples from. You don't know how to keep your accounting, check your mileage, all that stuff. So, you know, I think that's a wonderful philosophy that you're doing. And I think that every person out there who might be listening who has some experience in anything should be trying to you know, like you've said multiple times, pay it forward to others because we've all been there. And and you would like to think that if you were ever in need of something, that there would be someone out there who's going to help you out. And so, yes. it, and, and I can I can name countless number of times when people have in my life, as you already have uh, stated in yours. And I think keeping that perspective in mind and knowing that as we go through life, whatever experiences that we've learned that can be teachable moments. Mm -hmm. That's actually exactly why I wrote my book is because, excuse me, I want both my successes as well as my complete failures (laughs) to be teachable moments for others. And if I can help one person, one young diabetic, not neglect their diabetes and, and risk themselves of going blind, I feel like I've done my part, you know, Mm -hmm. so I want to try and pay it forward in my own way. And I feel like everyone out there can figure out their own way of of paying it forward to others. And, and on your part, I'm so, I'm so honored that you joined (laughs) me in this podcast and, um, we're going to cut this off and then continue to ramble on to each other. For we a have actually, more we have one more point. Ooh, please. The, yes. um, so the last point is I thought we should end with the success. Excellent. Yes. Um, please go first. So for me, my success, um, is from clients' reactions. Uh, okay. so maybe it's a little bit of validation as well, but, yep. uh, I really get personal joy and, uh, like, overwhelming like warmth from mm. when I give clients images that I feel like I've worked so hard on for them like yeah. I want them to love this uh, so when I get reactions where they're like overjoyed and enthusiastic then I know like I've produced something that was meaningful to you and not just that set of three pictures right so I'll say like that's my that's my um, big success some of your pictures like I don't even know these people <laughs> and just the composition of them I want them hanging up in my home um, but no, I think that's a wonderful success. And I, I similarly, uh, feel like my greatest success stories were not so much any kind of publicity or major case, uh, quote unquote, win. people in criminal defense don't tend to win much. So it's the small victories, but, um, you know, for me, it was always that feedback from the clients that I made a difference in their lives. And that, that's amazing. like you said, um, almost a bit of validation and that's something in college that my philosophy teacher told us. She was like, no one does anything in this life for no reason. Like, you're going to have some sort of beneficial reason for doing anything in this life. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? Like, what if you volunteer? What if you do Habitat for Humanity? And she's like, well, you feel good when you do it, don't you? And I'm yeah. like, son of a bitch. <laughs> Why are you so deep and right? But yes, so anywho, she was saying that you always get something when you do any kind of act. And to me, like, I found out I was almost, like, addicted to the validation and the gratitude that I received from my clients. Like, I fed off of that. The ones that were the greatest successes were, like, hey... I wasn't supposed, my sex crime wasn't supposed to be listed anymore. I committed a sex crime against an adult and that had a uh, registration period of, you know, 20 years. uh, And they're claiming that mine was against a child and that I have lifetime registration. And so now I'm in jail for a new crime. And one of my cellmates, uh, girlfriend, brought in the flyer that showed that I was a child molester 
and now they've distributed around the jail, and I'm afraid for my safety. Oh, and so I, you know, worked on his behalf to find the records from, like, I think the 70s, maybe, uh, in the courthouse, and they were sealed off and almost non-existent. Um, and I, I worked for a few months to contact the sex offender board in Massachusetts and get him off the registry once they acknowledged that they had made it. You know, it was a, it was a mistake. It was an error. But it was a huge error. Men in prison see a child molester a little bit differently than they see a rapist. Um, and that can be, you can be in great physical danger uh, in prison and in jail if you're seen as a quote-unquote kitty diddler. Um, so just that small act of getting him off the registry, he would call me like once a year, just update me on how he's doing, that he's doing well. I've had another client say, hey, I'm now a mentor for others. Um, I got visitation back with my daughter. I am a deacon in my church. You know, I remarried and I, those kind of success stories and for them to tell me that my efforts were, Part of the reason for their um, rehabilitation or having a more law-abiding, productive, happy life <clears throat> and aren't just defined by their grave mistakes in life um, are the biggest successes I could have ever asked for. That's amazing. It's what I miss most, honestly, mm -hmm. about practicing. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's a good topic. So I feel like we uh, we both ran the gamut. can yeah oh yeah we definitely <laughs> ran the gamut and I'm sorry for for dragging it all out with you but I just love talking to you because you're a great conversation <laughs> whether you like to admit it or not um, um, so just accept that compliment thank and you thank you very much believe you are too Kate oh why thank you I appreciate that very much it's been such a delight to have you join me and hopefully I can have you back. Yeah. And we can get more into these discussions on mental health. I think we can have a lot of topics. Yeah, that we can totally. I think, I think I might wrangle your uh, free weekends. <laughs> awesome. Well, Chris, we might have to fight over those. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so thank you so much for joining me. And I want to remind the listeners um, that anyone returning back um, from being at Hammer Time with Nikki and Kate fan that the podcast is now Hear Me Roar with Kate Butassi. And uh, the website is hearmeroarpodcast.com. Uh, you can find it on Instagram at Hear Me Roar Podcast, uh, Twitter at Hear Me Roar Pod, because I guess it was too long to do podcasts. Um, there's a Facebook page, a uh, YouTube page, a Google Plus page. And while the old episodes of Hammer Time with Nikki and Kate are still available on iTunes and Google Play, uh, I'm going to be working on getting this new version of the podcast up on both platforms as well for you to subscribe to. In the meantime, you can check it out on the website, um, which I'm sure you will have found through one of my various social media links. So I want to thank Angie again for joining me. Um, it's been a pure delight. And I hope you all have enjoyed um, our discussions. Um, and so if you have any questions or feedback or uh, suggestions for new upcoming episodes, please reach out to me. Um, you can reach out via any of those social media platforms through the website or at hearmeroarpodcast at gmail.com. So thanks again for joining, and till next time, my friends. <laughs>